Good morning. Yeah, welcome to PC Evangelical and Reformed Church. It's, isn't it great that summer is here? You know, we're, not, we're never sure when it's going to show up, but when it does get here, we're always ready for it and glad it's here. And we trust and pray that God will give you something to chew on as we worship the Lord together. Make sure you check your bulletin for the local times and listings of any announcements that may affect you the most specifically. We have some that we want to highlight this morning. We have some anniversaries in the Peace Church family. Um, Monday, it says either Monday or Wednesday. I got two different dates in the computer, but it's Judy and Steve Gazer's anniversary. Tuesday, Tammy and Hank Gillig. Wednesday, Julie and Brian Schmidt. Thursday, Jamie and Chad Lurkey. And Friday, Joanne and Charles Bernhardt all have anniversaries. Happy anniversary. <laughs> And we have some birthdays, too, in the Peace Church family. On Monday, it's Ann Leah's birthday. Tuesday, Paula Johnson's mom, Carol, celebrates her birthday. Wednesday, Craig Krieger turns 24. Thursday, Ivy Fister turns 4. Friday, Isaac turns 9 years old. And Zach Wolfel has a birthday on the 15th of June. Happy birthday, everybody. And do we have any other announcements to highlight as we begin our service? Yes, Maria. Okay, vacation Bible school registrations are due in, and July 10th through 14th is VBS this year, right? That's coming up fast also over at Camp Forest. Okay, this concludes our morning announcements. This is also the day, the first day of June, first Sunday of June, we like to recognize our high school and college graduates. I'm not going to have everybody come up, but I just want to let you know who they are. Um, Josh Neushart and Courtney Schwalbach graduated high school. I know that Courtney was the salutatorian at Brilliant High School. She's going on to UW-Madison. And Danielle Vanden Bogard and Aaron Vanden Bogard graduated from college a couple of weeks ago. Aaron is going to be getting married to Kevin Motter at the beginning of February of 2018. Um, is, Danielle is going to be doing vet tech work, and we're just going to pray for God's provision and guidance and leadership over their lives. Let us pray. God, we thank you for Danielle and Aaron and getting them through the hard work of school. And I pray, Lord, that you would set before them open doors of occupational opportunity so that they can use the gifts that you have given them for your glory. I pray that you would provide for all of their needs according to the, your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. We also pray for Courtney Schwalbach as she heads to Madison. And we pray for, for Josh Neushart. We pray, Lord, your, your guidance in their lives. And, and no matter where they are and the work that they're doing, may they always put their faith and trust in you and look to you for wisdom. We commit them to your care in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now take a moment to greet the person beside you and welcome them to PC Evangelical and Reform Church. Hey, good morning. Hi, Carson, Reagan. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Are you done with school for the summer? Congratulations. <laughs> Let's remain standing. When we're going through some difficult times, we must tell Christ about it. We must tell Jesus. That's our opening song, number 164, I Must Tell Jesus.
Amen. Good singing. We'll remain standing for the reciting of the Apostles' Creed, which is found in the back of the songbook on the right side and also on the screen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, he descended into hell. The day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy universal Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The kids can come up for the children's sermon. I also neglected to mention last week that we're not having communion this week. Communion stewards on vacation. We're going to have communion at next Sunday's service at the 9 a.m. service. But the kids can come up. Hey, Evan, how you doing? Hey, thanks for coming up. Hi, Corby. Good to see you. Well, thank you so much for coming up. Hi, how you doing? Good to see you, Reese. Hey, Bryce, how you doing? Sometimes we need help with things. If you're at school, who are people that you could ask to help you? Is there anyone at school that could help you? Your teacher, you can go to your teacher. What about at home, if, if, you need, if you're at home, and you need help with something, who could you ask for help when you're at home? <clears throat> you yep, you could ask your mom or your dad. What types of things do we sometimes need help with? Uh, opening your toys. Opening your toys, okay. <laughs> yeah, or hooking them up sometimes. <laughs> That's true. Or maybe you need help getting along with somebody, or you need help making the bed, or whether, whether you get it or not, it depends on the situation, but you probably will. Or you might need help with something outside, or maybe your bike is in the garage and it's stuck between the garbage can and the wall, and you can't get your bike out. You can ask your mom or your dad to help you get your bike out, right? But you know what? There's somebody else that we can go to for help anytime we want, even when there's no one else around. You know who that is? God. Very good. Number one answer on the board. The Bible says if we lack wisdom, we can ask God, and he's going to help us out. And so let's pray and, and thank God that he is there for us. Thank you, God, that... You are there for us, and we can ask you for help, and thank you for giving us moms and dads and teachers and friends and neighbors and, and individuals that we can trust and that we can get help when we need help. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. <laughs> Here you go. Thanks for coming up. Good to see you, Corby. Here you go, Bryce. Our Bible reading this morning is in the book of James, there, and there is a strong likelihood that James was actually the first letter of the New Testament that was written, somewhere between 44 and AD and 49 AD, and the theme of the book of James is God's plan to make us whole, mature, and complete 
in Christ. And you see the theme in James 1, verse 4, the verse we looked at last week, where it says, perseverance must finish its work so that you may become mature and complete. And that's the whole objective of this book, that even though the Christian community is only anywhere from 11 to 15 years old, it is God's desire for the people of faith to become spiritually mature, obeying the word of God, letting our faith be demonstrated by our works, James chapter 2, controlling our tongue, accepting people for who they are and not judging them for their socioeconomic status being different than yours. All these things, if we obey God, we become whole and mature and complete. And that's where we're going in the book of James. Today, we're in the first chapter, James 1, verses 5 through 8. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may become mature and complete, not lacking anything. Verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, He should ask God who generously gives to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. This is the word of God. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading and the teaching and the practicing and the carrying out of his word. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the scriptures. I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be faithful to the scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. Years back, Muhammad Ali was teasing Joe Frazier about what he was going to do to him when they finally fought in the ring. Ali said, in the first round, I'm going to float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. In the second round, I'm going to snap your head back with the jab. In the third round, I'm going to start doubling up and tripling up on the jab and dropping the occasional right hand. In the fourth round, I'm going to start putting punches together. I'm going to be landing combinations, lefts and rights and hooks and crosses and uppercuts. And Frazier says, well, what am I supposed to do when I'm getting hit with all that? Sit here and twiddle my thumbs? (laughs) And many of us are being hit with combinations this week, but we're being hit by life, and life hits harder than any physical punch. Maybe you're being hit with relationship problems, work problems, marriage problems, spiritual problems, academic problems, occupational problems, and it feels like the punches are coming from all angles and in combinations. Well, what are you supposed to do when you're getting hit with all that stuff? That's what James is going to talk about as we look at verses 5 through 8. The first four verses of James, we see God's plan for us in the middle of our trials. But beginning in verse 5, we see what our reaction and response should be while we're going through what we're going through. Because, yeah, it's terrific that God is accomplishing his purposes in our lives while we're going through difficulties, but what are we supposed to do while we're going through difficulties? How can we respond when life hurts? James says, let me tell you about it. James 1, verse 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God. You guys know what the difference is between knowledge and wisdom? Knowledge is information. Wisdom is the ability to apply and utilize and use that information as an action plan in your life. For example, you might say, Lord, I am well aware that Matthew 5 verse 10 says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I got to be honest with you, Lord, I don't feel blessed when that's happening to me. In fact, I I feel miserable. I don't 
like it when people razz me and ridicule me and tease me because of my newfound faith in Jesus Christ. And you know what I really don't like? I don't like it when people deliberately take the name of Jesus in vain. They use the name of Jesus as an expression of, of exasperation, and they're doing it just to get a rise out of me. And I know that I should have a thicker skin than that and blow that off, but I guess my skin isn't thick enough, so I need wisdom. How should I respond to that? And after you pray that prayer, you go online and you find an article in Christianity Today about how to deal with ridicule when your faith is being tested. And it says, first, thank God that you're a member of his family. And then thank God that you have a relationship with the one who knows you the best and loves you the most. Forge friendships with people of faith in the church who share the same love for Christ as you do. And then you can tell those who criticize and are critical, you can say, I respect the fact that you don't believe the way I do. Please respect the fact that I have my private beliefs. Just because you don't believe the same way I do doesn't mean we can't get along. It doesn't mean we have to mock each other. And then you're done with the article and you're like, wow, thank you, God, for the timely word of wisdom. It's just what I needed for my particular situation at work. Or maybe you're thinking, all right, Lord Jesus, I know James says if any of you lacks wisdom that he should um, ask God. And right now I'm in a situation where I need wisdom. At the place where I work, a new company bought it out, and they're taking an extra $300 each month out of my paychecks to go toward the health insurance. And I'm really grateful that I have health insurance. But Lord, I'm really missing that $300. I was counting on that money to help pay off my little girl's braces. I'm, things are tight financially now, and I need wisdom to know how to react and respond to this particular trial in my life. Well, right after you pray that prayer, you watch a video by motivational speaker Hal Elrod called The Miracle Morning, how he gets up every morning at 5 o'clock and he recites his goals and vision back to God and he writes down possible solutions to problems that he's going through. And so you think, well, that's a pretty good idea, except 5 o'clock's a little early. So you wake up the next morning at 5.30 and you make for yourself some Starbucks dark French roast coffee and a hot English muffin with real butter, not that fake stuff. And you sit down at your desk and you say, Lord, I pray that you would manifest some wisdom so I can respond to this financial circumstance in my life. And you just start writing as the Lord gives you ideas. Number one, you can talk to the boss. You can say, I've worked here a long time. It's been a blessing and an honor to make a difference for the company. But man, I'm really missing that $300 extra that's coming out of my paycheck. Is there anything I can do? Or is there anything we can do to try to get me closer to where I was so I can pay off my little girl's braces and get to work on putting a new roof on our house? Number two, you could start floating your resume out there and seeing if the Lord is going to open another door of opportunity. Number three, you could have a rummage sale or a garage sale or you could sell something on Craigslist or Amazon.com or eBay and generate a little bit of extra money and start hitting that debt on the braces. Number four, you could put a flyer up in the post office saying that you're willing to help people with their computer problems. Number five, you could put a flyer up at the Quick Trip saying you're willing to clip lawn for a day out of the week. Number six, this is not what you want to do, but you're willing to put in a resume for a part-time, one-day-a-week job to make up for the missing income. And you write all these things down, and you say, Lord, I don't know which one is going to work. I don't know which one is best. But thank you for giving me the wisdom to attack this situation. Following week, you go talk to the boss. And he says, you have been a longtime employee. You're one of the good ones. Let's look at your package. Let's look at the numbers. Let's crunch them. Let's see if it's possible to get you closer to where you need to be so you can take care of these things in your life. And then you go home and say, wow, <laughs> I was not expecting that to happen. I didn't think it... That was going to be the top choice at all. But Lord, you made a way when there seemed to be no way. I thank you for the miracle morning. I thank you for the wisdom. I thank you for the idea to do this and that you're helping me to work through this particular situation. 
And when James tells us we should ask for wisdom to help us to get through what we're going through, he may have had in mind the words of Jesus Christ himself from the Sermon on the Mount. Well, how do I know that? Matthew 7, 7, Jesus says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened. For anyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be open. And in the context of Matthew, it's the same as in James, that you can ask God for help when you're going through a difficult time. And in James 1, verse 5, he gives us some reasons why it's okay for us to ask God for wisdom for what we're going through. The first reason that he mentions is, so, is because God is a giver. Two times in James 1.5, it mentions that God gives. It says he generously gives to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. And we know from John 3.16 that God is a giver, because it says God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Can you imagine talking to God and saying, God, I've been having this problem. I'm so worried. I'm so scared. I'm so stressed. I need your guidance. I need your wisdom. Can you imagine God with his arms crossed going, nope. Nope, 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 nope. It's not happening. In fact, to tell you the truth, I forgot all about you until you started bugging me. No. God loves to give wisdom. Proverbs 2, verse 6 says, From the Lord comes wisdom, and out of his mouth comes understanding. Imagine it's a child's birthday, and the father and mother present him with a gift, and he opens it up, and it's a brand new Sony PlayStation 4. He says, this is just what I've always wanted, and there's even a couple of video games with it. Thank you for the new PlayStation. And he tears it open starts hooking it up. He gets the controllers and puts them into the console. But then he notices he doesn't have an HDMI cable to connect the box to the TV, and it's not wireless. He can't use it. And he says, Mom, Dad, thank you so much for the PlayStation, but I can't use it because I don't have connecting cables. And the father laughs and goes, I know. I did that on purpose. I didn't want you to use the gift I gave you. <laughs> what kind of a parent would do that. Of course, a parent would want their child to be able to utilize the gift that they have given him. And God is the same way. He already gave you the greatest gift of all when he gave you Jesus Christ on the cross and rose from the dead. Why wouldn't God also want to give you gifts that help you better experience the presence of Jesus in your life? Romans 8 verse 32 says, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but graciously gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things, including the precious gift of wisdom? Another reason why James says we should ask God for wisdom is because he's a generous giver. He generously gives to all without finding fault. God's not going to say, you know what? I'm not going to give you wisdom because I gave you some last week. I helped you out in math class last week, so you don't get no help in social studies this week. I'm sorry. <laughs> No, he's not that way. It's his heart's desire to respond with wisdom and gifts for his people. Some years back, Jeannie and I went to Door County, and we went to a fudge shop in Egg Harbor called Gomi's Goodies. Anyone ever heard of Gomi's Goodies? I think they're still in business. You're going to have to Google it. But we went in there, and the owner was so generous he gave us samples of almost every bit of fudge he had in the store. I walked out of there with a sugar high. He had cherry fudge, chocolate chocolate fudge, chocolate fudge, of course, and all these different kinds of fudge I never heard of. And I said to Genie, man, we better buy some fudge while we're here. <laughs> this guy's being waste so generous. He's not going to have nothing left by the time we walk out. But that's the way God is. He is super generous, always giving out samplings of wisdom from the Word of God. 
Look at uh, 1 Kings chapter 3. Solomon becomes king over Israel. And the Lord appeared to him and said, you can ask me for anything you want. And Solomon said, oh, let me think about that. You know what? You've shown me great kindness to allow me to become king over Israel. But man, it is a hard job to be a king. Who can govern this great people of yours? Please give me a wise and discerning heart so that I can administer justice. And the Bible says in 1 Kings 3.10 that the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. And he said, because you have asked me for this and you didn't ask for wealth or health or long life or the death of your enemies, I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that you will be different from all the kings that came before you and all the ones that come after you. That's the kind of God we serve, a God that desires to make us into the people that he created us to be. James says another reason in verse 5 why we should ask God for wisdom is because he generously gives to all. God does not show favoritism. He offers the gift of insight and illumination and knowledge and wisdom to anybody who asks. He's not going to say, you know what? I was going to give you wisdom to tackle this problem. But I found out from a friend of a friend that you are a Minnesota Viking fan. I'm sorry, but I don't think there's enough wisdom in this world to help you out. <laughs> I, I mean, it, it would be no good. So I'm sorry, you can't have wisdom. No. Did you know that God loves even Viking fans? <laughs> I, I looked it up. It says it in the Bible that he loves everybody. John 15, 9, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. And God offers it to all the people. And another reason why James says we can ask God for wisdom is because he generously gives to all without finding fault. He's not going to say, hey, what'd you do with the wisdom I gave you last week? You didn't put that in the practice, so I ain't going to give you nothing else this week. No, he doesn't find fault. And he responds to the prayers and the pleadings and the heartfelt cries of his people. Now, it's our responsibility as Christians to learn to respect and cherish and treasure the wisdom that God gives. It's a very important gift. I was reading about Henry Ford, who was the president of the Ford Motor Company, and he hired Charlie Steinmetz to put in a bunch of pieces of equipment to help run his factory. Well, one day, the machine stopped working and Ford was panicked because he had to make cars. So he called Charlie up. And Charlie came in for a few hours and started tinkering with the different pieces of equipment. And then he flipped the switch and all of a sudden, the machines whirred back into life. And Ford said, thank you very much until he got the bill. The bill was for $10,000. And Ford wrote Charlie a note saying, I appreciate that you fixed our problems, but why is it $10,000? You know, he, Ford was a notoriously tight-fisted tycoon. And so Steinmetz said, well, $10 for tinkering with the equipment, but for knowing where to tinker and how to tinker, $9,990. Ford said, I understand, and he paid the bill. <laughs> Ford learned to appreciate not only the work, but the wisdom and the insight and the special training that goes into doing the work. And as believers in Christ, we have to understand that the greatest gift of all that we have is eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ and his love. But after that, wisdom and understanding and knowledge is the greatest gift that we could ask for. I don't know about you, but I wish I could go back in time to the 18-year-old Mark Axelrod and tell him a few things. How many of you wish you could tell your younger self a few things? One thing I would say to my younger self is, self, stop trying to preach and convert your parents all the time. You know, they're going to get aggravated. They're going to think you joined a cult. How about instead you introduce them to the new Mark Axelrod? Why don't you start cleaning the house? Make the bed. Show respect. Get along with your brother and sister. Let them see Christ in action, and maybe someday they'll be ready to hear about Christ with your words. 
Another thing I would tell my younger self is, hey, younger self, how you doing? I'm your older self. I want you to put $2,000 a year into an S&P 500 fund. Do that for 10 years. Don't touch it until you're 55, and there'll be more than a million dollars in there. You'll be able to retire and not have to worry about money. <laughs> Can't do that. I am going to my nephew's high school graduation party in a couple of weeks. I'm going to try to drop that bit of wisdom on him. I don't know if he's going to listen or not. But don't you have things in your life that you wish you can pass on to your younger self? You won't be able to do that, but you can benefit from God's wisdom and knowledge today. I was just watching a program on TV where one girl was not getting along with another girl, and she said, I've been reading the Bible lately, and the other girl said, don't be telling me about that religious stuff. And she said, but no, really, I've been reading it. And it's really got a lot of cool things to say, especially about forgiveness. Do you think the world would be a wiser and better place today if we listened more to what the Bible said about forgiveness? You betcha. So ask God for wisdom. James 1 verse 6 says, when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. You say, well, wait a minute. How is that possible? I'm a human being. Of course I'm going to have doubts and questions once in a while. Even John the Baptist had doubts, and he was the greatest man to ever live up until the time of Christ. It says in Matthew 11, he was thrown in jail for telling Herod that it's unlawful for you to be married to Philip's wife. And he got thrown in jail for that. He was discouraged. He sent people to Jesus saying, is it really you, Jesus? Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for somebody else? So if a guy like John the Baptist can have doubts, why is James saying, I can't ever have questions or doubts? Well, James is saying that we need to have a strong, consistent faith. But he's not saying that we can't question things. He's just saying that we have to be all in when we go to God. We can't be divided. The Greek word for doubt means to be deeply conflicted or separated or divided. You can't go to God and say, God, give me wisdom, but there's another part of you that doesn't even believe that God responds to prayer. you got to be all in when you go to the Lord in prayer because he who doubts is like a wave being blown around by the wind. You know, waves can't do anything when the wind is blowing. They're just going to go where the wind is going. And people who are not rooted and strong in their faith, they're going to be blown around by the winds of worry and stress and circumstances. James says that a person who is feeling that way should realize they're not going to get anything from the Lord. They are a double-minded man, unstable in all they do. And the Greek expression for double-minded literally means double-souled. It's spiritual schizophrenia to believe in God with one part of you and not believe in God in the other part of you. It's sort of like a little boy at the edge of a swimming pool, and his father is in the pool 30 feet away, and he says, come on in and jump. Do your first dive. I'm here. I'll protect you. I'll watch over you. And the boy is thinking, well, first he's shivering and shaking with cold and fear. And he's thinking, well, I trust in my father's care and protection, but I also know what water can do when you don't know what you're doing. I could dive in. The water could go up my nose or down my throat. I could start choking. I could black out. I've never done this before. And the boy's fear of the water is bigger than his faith in his father. And so instead of jumping in, he ends up standing on the edge shaking. And so many of us are that way with God because we have more fear of our situations than we have faith in our Savior. And we end up shaking and quaking in fear rather than looking, giving it to God and asking him for wisdom. And Jesus is inviting us to say, and saying, come on and ask because I am a giver. I give generously to all without finding fault. And think about all the people that are up in heaven right now. Revelation 7, 9 says, I saw heaven open and there was a great multitude which no man could count standing in front of the throne of God and in front of the Lamb. If Jesus knows how to get people from down here to up there, then he knows how to get you through whatever you're going through on the way to where you're going. So you can have faith and confidence in the God and in the Christ 
who loves you. He's going to get you through this hour of grief. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in Jesus Christ. He loves you. He died for you and rose again. Put your faith and trust in the one who loves you most and knows you best. Jesus loves you, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Amen. Let's remain seated as we sing our song of worship. Number 166, Sweet Hour of Prayer. Amen. And as we enter into this sweet hour of prayer, we want to remember um, Eunice Hubinger in prayer. Her son George passed away yesterday. Eunice is here with us today. That's Beverly Bowman and Sharon Allen, sister, and they're here today. And we just want to remember them in our prayers as they're going through what they're going through. We have any other requests? Yes, Lori. Okay, we'll do. Yes, Jennifer. Okay. What's her name? Okay. 
Yes, Lynn. Okay, we'll do. Yes. I want to pray for my friend Brenda. She's going through a rough time. Her brother and her uncle both committed suicide, and her, she's really having a rough time of it, and she needs the strength of God to pull her through this. Okay, we'll do. Yes, Billy. Will do. Okay. Yes, Tom. We'll do. We'll pray for those. Let us pray. God, I'm glad that we can pray to you and, and you invite us to come to you for fellowship, and we're not only praying to you for things we want, we're praying because we just like to have the intimacy. We just want to have the contact just to be together. And thank you that we can do that together as a church family. We want to pray for the requests that you put upon our hearts. Um, we, we pray for Eunice Hubinger. Her son George passed away yesterday, and I pray Lord, for comfort and consolation and the compassion of Christ to cover her and her family to know the love of Jesus. Lord, we also pray for Lori Anholt's father-in-law for a full recovery and healing for him. We pray for her sister-in-law who has a procedure this week and pray that that goes well. Um, we pray for um, Jennifer's um, fr friend's um, kids, um, her um, the mom passed away, and the, and the kids are by themselves, and we just pray, God, for help for that family in this very difficult situation. We just pray for, for healing and for wholeness and for the presence of Christ. We pray, Lord, for those affected by the explosion in Cambria, the violence in London, England. Jesus said, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. And we're hearing about them almost every week, almost every day. And we pray, God, for those affected by that to find comfort and hope and strength in Christ. Lord, we pray for Lynn Stecker's parents. We pray for her mom to have grace and strength and her father to come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. We also pray for... A family friend of Lynn's, a lady named Sandy, passed away, and we pray for comfort and consolation for her loved ones. We also pray for Sherry Giese's friend, Brenda. She's going through a rough time. Both her uncle and her brother have died, and she's just overwhelmed with sadness and discouragement. Please help her to find comfort in friends and in the greatest friend of all, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we also pray for all the unspoken requests around the parish community. Give our leaders wisdom to make wise choices. May our faith not be in finances or even in the future, but in our heavenly Father. May our faith and trust be in you. Most of all, God, we thank you for Jesus, who taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, as the ushers come forward, we'll take up the morning offering.
please rise. Father, thank you for these gifts and help us to use them for the work of the ministry in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's remain standing for the closing song of the service, number 162. What a friend we have in Jesus. Number 162. Amen. Thank you for worshiping God with us on the first Sunday of June. And may the Lord leave you with this word of blessing and encouragement over your life. Peace to the brothers and sisters in love with faith from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Amen. Have a wonderful day. God bless and go in peace.